introduce uh, Bjorn Lundberg for a, a, an hour-long conversation about how to make the world a better place. Um, most of you may know uh, Mr. Mr. Lundberg's work through the Skeptical Environmentalist book that he put out, um, probably, what's 2001, 2002? Um, so some years ago, obviously quite controversial at the time um, and, and probably to date, uh, with a focus on uh, climate change and, and how best to address the problems of climate change and arguing to some degree that climate change per se wasn't necessarily the largest environmental issue that we faced. Uh, he's continued to work in the spirit of um, using uh, economic uh, tools to try and address questions of both environmental and development. Uh, environmental change and developmental challenges that we face around the world, uh, and is currently working on a project to figure out how the world should best spend the next $75 billion that we may be investing in the cause of global development. Uh, working with the United Nations uh, and countries around the world, we were talking a little bit around the, the margins about some of the challenges in getting into that process, but I'm, I'm delighted to have him here for what I'm sure will be a provocative and informative discussion. So with that, Bjorn. Thank you very much. It's, uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and I would love to, uh, uh, to talk a little bit about how we're going to think about prioritizing big issues. So as, as, as you mentioned, I've, I've uh, worked a lot within the environmental area. Uh, but quite frankly, what we're doing with the Copenhagen Consensus is a broader thing. It's essentially to talk about how do you spend money to do the most good? Where do you get the biggest bang for your buck? Uh, so we actually wrote a book. Uh, last, uh, late last year called How to Spend uh, 75 Billion to work, Make the World a Better Place. If you want a copy, I'm sorry, I just flew in from China, so I'm not carrying a lot of copies, but if you want one, uh, send an email to Pam and we'll send you a PDF version. Uh, you know, people say I should have written the book How to Make 75 Billion, but that's a, that's a totally different sort of book. But, but this is essentially the kind of, uh, if you were Bill Gates, we actually do this with, with high school students. We, we, uh, we, we call it Bill Gates for a day. You know, if you had $75 billion, how would you spend it? It turns out that it's important to say you can't spend it on yourself. Uh, but, but the idea here is then to say, you know, where do you get the biggest bang for the buck? And, and their sort of initial response is, I can fix all problems. You know, they think 75 billion is a lot of money. And then of course they realize, no, it's, while it's a lot of money, it's actually not enough to fix all problems. And then they really want to find out, how do I spend it in the best possible way? And that's the conversation that I want to get you involved in. Uh, we have about an hour, and I actually want you to help me prioritize. So I brought some strips. I'll, I'll distribute them just a little bit. Uh, but you know, to think about how do we prioritize big issues. So if you'll just allow me, you know, just let's remember, there are lots and lots of problems in this world. And you know, we, we talk about some of them. We probably should be talking about a lot more of them. There's about a billion people uh, that don't have clean drinking water. Uh, pretty much everyone in the world would be better off uh, if we didn't have subsidies, especially for agricultural uh, 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 products. Um, it, it, one of the things we rarely talk about is every year, two new civil wars, typically in places you haven't even heard of, and you know, very often they don't get, uh, uh, they get very little or no uh, attention in the global press. They cost about $60 billion per civil war. Not mostly, as you'd imagine, because people get killed. Yes, they do get killed, but because it disrupts their economies, and that essentially means that people lose a lot of income, and that actually means that they and their babies get a lot less health care. And that's what really kills most people in civil wars. It's not the actual conflict, but it's the fact of the fallout of, 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 the, uh, of the economic downturn in these, uh, in these areas. Uh, likewise, about 3.5 million people die each year from indoor air pollution. The World Health Organization actually just upped that uh, uh, three weeks ago, uh, saying it's 4.3 million people. So about one in 12 people that die on this planet die because of indoor air pollution. Basically, lots of poor people, about 3 billion people, cooking and keeping warm with open fires. Uh, and 20% of all deaths in developing countries are due to easily curable infectious diseases. The list goes on. My point here is simply to say there are lots and lots of problems. What should we do with, say, the next $75 billion? 
So we're not talking about recasting the entire universe of, of spending. Uh, that would be fun to think about, but it's not going to happen. And also, our models would not be very good at handling it if we sort of wanted to make a radical break. Instead, we're talking about how would you marginally change the world? And $75 billion is actually a marginal change uh, over four years. It's about 10 to 15 percent of the, what the world spends on overseas development aid. It's a lot less than what the world, for instance, spends on, on, uh, on uh, climate policies. So essentially, we're saying take a small chunk or imagine a small extra chunk and say, how would you spend that? Where would you do the most good? So right now, yeah, so this is for corporate social responsibility, for philanthropy, it's for government spending. Right now, our focus seems to be directed by you know, who has the most cute animals, or who have the most crying babies, or who have the greatest PR groups. And, and while that's very understandable, it's probably not the w best way to deal with this issue. issue. I would argue that a lot of organizations that try to garner attention to all their worthy subjects tend to focus on sort of panic. There's an issue here. We need to fix it. You need to give us money. And you sort of ramp up the message. It makes for good PR, but it doesn't make for very good policy. So I would argue we can do better. And what we're trying to do is essentially say, well, what's the most cost-effective way to deal with a lot of these issues? That's, of course, a little more boring. It's not as, you know, as sexy, but it just happens to do a lot more good. So really what we try to do is to set priorities. But setting priorities, I mean, in principle, everybody agrees. You know, yes, we should do the things that will do the most good. But in reality, of course, that also means when you say this should come first, this should come second, it also means you have to say something should come last. And of course, that always annoys people. So saying a prioritization is important also means saying what shouldn't come first. And that inevitably means you end up annoying people. So the people that we typically have at the top of our list think our organization is the greatest thing since sliced bread and think, you know, this is wonderful. And they constantly mention it. And of course, the people who are advocate the, 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 the things at the bottom will just say we're stupid and you shouldn't listen to us and all that kind of stuff. It's very obvious, but it also engenders a lot of controversy. But at the end of the day, I think we need to ask ourselves, where can we do the most good? And that's really what I want to talk to you about and, and, and have you try and help us uh, with, with doing. So these are the 10 challenges we looked at last year. We do this every four years. So we did the last one in 2012, where we get about 100 of the world's top economists to look across all these different areas with lots of teams. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about the process. But fundamentally, these are the issues that we looked at. Armed conflicts, biodiversity, chronic disease, climate change, education, hunger and malnutrition infectious diseases, natural disasters, population growth, and water and sanitation. I think most people would accept that, yes, this is definitely a very comprehensive list of, of the world's big problems. You can always imagine there should be one more. We also got to prioritize, so we've sort of said we, we, we're only going to look at 10. Uh, but these are definitely big issues. You know, a typical sort of journalist question is then to say, well, so of, of these big problems, which problem is the biggest? It's sort of a very natural question. It also turns out to be wrong. It's not a well-formed question. Right? Uh, you can't ask what's the biggest problem without knowing that there's a solution. I mean, arguably, the biggest problem in the world is that we all die. Uh, but you know, we don't have a good solution to that. Economists would say we have a severe undersupply of immortality. Uh, but we don't quite know how to fix that. right? So the issue here is not to say what's the biggest problem. We need to look at what are the smartest solutions. So if you look at armed conflicts, for instance, you could go in and say, should we do conflict prevention? Should we have peacekeeping forces for the UN? What are the solutions? And then what we try to do is to say, well, how much would that solution cost? And what's the likelihood that it'll work? And how much good would that solution then do? So we're basically saying, how much money would you spend? How much good would you end up doing? Likewise, for biodiversity, maybe we should protect more areas. Right now, we have protected about 12% of the Earth's surface. Maybe we should protect more. How much will that cost? How much good will it do? Obviously, it mo won't mostly be measured in lives uh, saved, because it's not really about human lives. But it's about the fact that we'll like the idea that there will be more biodiversity to preserve for future generations. Likewise, with chronic disease, maybe we should have a tobacco tax. Uh, 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 one fun fact is that in the 20th century, we estimated that about 100 million people died from tobacco. In the 21st century, uh, mostly because uh, China and India are smoking like crazy, uh, we're actually estimating on current trends, uh, we will lose about a billion people 
to tobacco. So maybe we should do something about that. Maybe we should have a heart attack pill. So these are very cheap. We know how to deal with them in developed countries. As developing countries are increasingly avoiding infectious diseases, maybe we should start getting more heart attack pills. A lot of people die from heart attack in, in the developing world. And on and on. There are lots and lots of solutions for all of these areas. It makes it more complicated. But it also makes it a lot more interesting because we're not talking about is a problem a big problem or a small problem, but we're talking about are there good solutions or bad solutions. And typically, they're both good and bad solutions to pretty much all of these. So it's about finding the good solutions to the big problems in the world. And that's really what I want to uh, get you involved in. So let me just talk a little bit about how we do this. We, we, uh, we team up with some of the world's top economists, for instance, on in infectious disease. We work with Dean Jameson, um, who's basically written the, uh, the manual for the World Health Organization about 305 diseases in the world and what their cost and benefits are. Uh, he has a team of economists behind him. So he goes in and looks at a lot of different solutions. Uh, I'm just going to look at three of them. And again, I'm just going to do them very, very quickly. He looks at tuberculosis, HIV vaccine, and malaria. But he doesn't just say, this is important. He says, for every dollar you spend on tuberculosis on the DOTS approach, which is basically getting, getting people uh, uh, medicine but making sure they keep taking it. Uh, I don't know if you've ever, I mean, it's a problem in many places. But if you get medicine from your doctor, once you get good, it's hard to remember to keep taking the medicine far after, long time after you've gotten, uh, gotten well again. And that's the problem with, uh, with uh, tuberculosis. You actually need to take your medication for a very long time. You also need to make sure that you're actually cured, that it wasn't uh, a, 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 a variant uh, that was actually resistant to the medicine you got. So with all that and with the smartest approaches, they estimate that for every dollar spent in tuberculosis, you will do about $15 worth of good. That's pretty fantastic. On HIV vaccine, they estimate, and this was the first uh, cost benefit for HIV vaccine ever done, they estimate that for every dollar spent, you'll do about $11 worth of good. For malaria, $1 will do $35 worth of good. Suddenly, you get a very different approach to understanding these are not just good things, but some of them are phenomenal things. Of course, we also need to have a conversation about what went into those numbers. Do we believe those numbers? When you ask an academic, they'll come up with answers, but obviously they're not the true answers. So we actually asked two other groups of, 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 uh, of uh, academics, also economists, to give perspectives on this and basically tell us, yeah, but their model overestimate this, the cost is underestimated here, all these kinds of things. So we actually hear a broad uh, uh, sort of range of conversations on what will work and what won't. Then we do this for all the different panels. And then we have an expert panel. Uh, last time we had four Nobel laureates. Listening to all of these guys, listening to all the arguments, and then basically prioritizing across all these different areas. And that's essentially what I'd like to have you do here today. Uh, I have physical strips for you here in the room, the ones who are following on, on, the, uh, on, on the internet. You'll, I'm sorry, you'll have to make up your own strips. Uh, but basically, I want to give you the exact same technology that we have uh, with the Nobels. Um, here, if you could just distribute this. Um, and um, these were actually cut in Beijing. Uh, I just gave a talk at uh, Peking University there. Um, so essentially, I just have these, uh, and I was told that we only have about 45 minutes and because we wanted to have uh, questions and answers. So I'm actually going to cut out one of these solutions because it takes a long time to explain it. Um, but So we'll just be using six of these uh, solutions. And I basically just want you to help prioritize these issues. So. If we can just take a look at some of these, you know, again, this was, uh, this was the list of the solutions that I showed you. Um, I'd love to go through all of them with you, but you know, again, we have a very limited time. So I just want to give you the gist of this idea uh, and just take a look at three of the problems. So let's just take a look at three of the challenges, climate change, education, and hunger and malnutrition. I've taken them because I'm sure this is some of the things that would interest you and that would be exciting and they'll also make for sort of a good comparison. But obviously we could have looked at a lot of different things and essentially, of course, 
you should look at everything. If you really had 75 billion, you probably wouldn't just want uh, this room to sit for an hour and then we'll decide where, where exactly to spend it. But it's the, it's the, it's the idea uh, that, that I'm hoping. So let me start off with hunger and malnutrition. So if I could ask you to take the first two strips that you have up here. The first two strips are basically for hunger and malnutrition. So just simply tear off the first two ones and then tear each one of them up. So you have these two strips. And basically what I want you to do is to basically, when, when, when we talked about these first two, two, two solutions, decide which of these two would you first fund if you had money? Would you fund this before you fund this or the other way around? So it's really very, very simple. Of course, we're gonna put in more and more and eventually get a, uh, end up with a ranking of all six. So hunger and malnutrition, it's a big problem. There's about a billion people that go to bed hungry each day. I mean, it's almost in, inconceivable. About one, one in seven people on this planet go to bed hungry each day. It's not because there's not enough food, it's mostly because they're poor. They can't afford to actually uh, buy the food. Uh, uh, the numbers remain pretty constant over the last 40 years uh, because there's a lot more people in the world. The prevalence has dropped from 34% uh, in 1970 to about 18% today. Um, a large part of this is, co of course, uh, because of two different things. Uh, we've had a lack of innovation since the first green revolution that we have around 1970. How many have heard of Norman Borlaug? Uh, Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Prize and, and Peace Prize in 1970 for essentially in, in, uh, instigating, starting, instigating? Uh, the, the, uh, the first green revolution, uh, basically providing much more output for every plot of land you know, with dwarf varieties, with higher inputs, of, uh, especially of fertilizer. Uh, we could dramatically increase the yields of, of most basic crops. Uh, and it's estimated that he probably saved somewhere between one and two billion people. Now that's pretty cool to put in your CV. Uh, but since then, We've basically been complacent, so we haven't done very much. So we haven't been focusing on keeping getting more and more out of every plot of land. Uh, and of course, also, we're now planting lots of uh, uh, crop with f uh, biofuels. Essentially, in the US, uh, you're using about 40% of, of uh, the corn yield in the US uh, to produce uh, uh, fuel which in some fundamental sense is, is morally wrong, right? I mean, you're actually using about 5% of the world's calories that we produce to produce into uh, fuel instead of helping feeding the world. Of course, it doesn't it directly go to helping feeding the world, but it increases the price, which makes it harder for poor people to buy. So these are some of the problems that, that we have to face. But again, what we ask them, uh, the, the, uh, the experts, was then basically, well, how do you fix that? How do you go about doing that? They had lots of different solutions. Again, I'm just gonna look at two of them. One is research and development to increase yield enhancement, essentially get a second green revolution going. And the other one is reduce chronic undernutrition in preschoolers. Sort of a more standard kind of approach. Let's just make sure that kids, especially very young kids, are fed well. But there are also lots and lots of other things, and you can read all the papers either in the, in the uh, How to Spend 75 Billion or on, online at CopenhagenConsensus.com. There's all the papers available. They, they look, for instance, on crop advisory text messages, you know, the idea that you send out uh, 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 to farmers in third world countries, you should plant this because this is actually going to be good this year. Uh, you should plant it now because we estimate that this is going to be the best time to plant it. You should harvest now. You should uh, uh, sell it here because that's where you're going to get more, uh, most money. I thought this was going to be a phenomenal idea. It turns out it's not all that great. It probably gives you a couple of dollars back in the dollar. So it's a nice thing, but not all that ter terrific. But you know, there are lots of other opportunities I'm just going to look at two of these solutions. So let's talk about the first one, increase yield uh, uh, on, uh, uh, through R&D. It's something we know very well how to do. Uh, we are doing some of this, mostly for first world countries. We're spending about $5 billion per year and probably likely to keep doing that uh, till 2050. So that's sort of the standard model if we don't do anything. And then what the researchers did was say, imagine if we spend $8 billion more on research and development into agricultural uh, yield enhancement every year. Uh, uh, so we get up to 13 billion per year. Uh, up till 2050. Because we've done this a lot, we have a pretty good understanding of what that would actually mean. 
Uh, it would probably increase growth rates for crop yields of about 0.4 percentage points and livestock yields by about 0.2 per, uh, percentage points. So not very much, but because it's going to be accumulated over almost half a century, it's actually going to have a huge impact. Not so much in GDP, because agriculture makes up a smaller and smaller part of GDP. So yes, it would increase GDP a little bit, but it's not really what matters. What would matter a lot more is it would lower food prices, which of course is incredibly important for poor people, and it would reduce the number of hungry. Remember, it wouldn't eradicate the number of hungry, and that's one of the crucial points of all of the things we're talking about. We're not solving problems. We're making them smaller, we're reducing it. Because if you're solving it, if you're fixing the last guy who's hungry, don't go hungry. Of course, that would be really, really nice. But that's probably going to be phenomenally expensive. And you could do something else with that money and do much more good elsewhere. So the idea is we're reducing the problem, but we're not solving it. Um, and the cost, again, I'm just going to do the very simple cost and benefit. The cost is just basically the discounted cost of $8 billion over the next half century. So it's about $184 billion. We actually use two different discount rates. Uh, that'll become even more important when we talk about education and, and, and climate change. But basically, I'm just going to give you one number because otherwise this just becomes way, way too complicated. But essentially, you can, you can adjust in that. We can also have a, a, a discussion when you, when you ask the questions about whether this should be higher or lower. So the cost is fairly simple. We're just spending $8 billion a year more. The benefits, if you just look at what's the benefit to consumers and also to producers. Well, producers actually lose because the prices are going to drop. But because we're all consumers and we'll gain a lot more, the overall benefit is significant to the world. The Economist estimates about $3.5 trillion. So on that very, very simple basis, a little bit depending on your, uh, on your discount rate, it's simply dividing those two numbers with each other. And you get a benefit cost ratio of somewhere between 16 and 21. So basically, for every dollar you spend on extra research and development, you do somewhere between 16 and $21 of good in the world. Now, that's a very simple assumption. But of course, it's also a very, very, uh, uh, a very tiny part of the benefits. There are a number of other benefits that we need to calculate into this number. Yes, we get uh, uh, cheaper foods. That's great. But it also is very, very important that through research and development, we can also make variability lower. That's important because variability is really what kills most people. Remember, you know, it's not the fact that you can't afford uh, 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 food most of the time. It's the fact that every once in a while, there's a huge drought. And then prices spikes. And then you can't afford it. And then you die. And then, of course, it's no real help that, that prices drop next year. Uh, so the idea here is if we could have drought-resistant species, if we could have saline-resistant species, if we could focus more on these things, which, of course, will also help address, for instance, climate change. Uh, or the impacts of climate change, we will actually make sure a lot more people will survive to also be able to buy next year when the prices drop down again. The, the experts uh, did this estimate. It's the first cost benefit for variability. They had very, very large estimates, uh, but the Nobels didn't actually believe that. It probably have some benefit, but not, not nearly as much as what they like. They talked about in the high 50s. It's more likely that the benefit cost ratio, including the, the one I mentioned of above, is somewhere between 20 and 25. So it makes it an even better investment, but it's not, again, phenomenal. But there are two more things we need to remember. If you spend more money on research and development so that you get higher yields, it also means we have to chop down less forests. So that will help biodiversity. Basically, as we get more and more people, we can either grow more food on the same amount of land, or we'll have to cut down nature in order to be able to feed more people on more land. The more we can do through yield increases, the less we have to chop down extra land. So that actually means we'll save forests if we estimate how much people are willing to spend on making sure that we get more biodiversity. So this is first world is typically wanting to do good for biodiversity, we can actually come out with about a trillion or, or so more in ecosystem benefits. You have a question? I've been told that you should, you should use the microphone. Sure. Thanks, yeah. It seems to me that one of the, typically the way we increase yields is by channeling the crops into more and more of a monoculture, which reduces the diversity in the crops, which means that when a new threat comes along, the yield is more vulnerable 
than it was before. So how does that fit with your notion of reduced variability um, in a situation where, say, all of a sudden we have a plague of a new, new variety yeah. of locust? It's, it's a very good question. It's not modeled. In, uh, and I'm not sure how exactly we would model it. We've certainly seen in, in commercial agriculture uh, that we've been able to handle the threats that have been so far. Uh, but that, of course, is no guarantee for the next uh, uh, risk. One of the ways that we could do that, and that's not included in this, is having more of a gene bank. I mean, we already do have that. Uh, and you know, that turned out to be incredibly important for, uh, for the wheat rust uh, and, and many of the other big threats that we've had uh, uh, to agriculture in the past. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know. Uh, so, so the answer is uh, it's probably not a good way to try and go to have less monoculture in that sense that you have even lower yields. That would probably end up making you much, much more risky every year. But you do need some way of thinking about how you're going to sort of avoid these big challenges. Uh, and you know, the way I see it, again, is a gene bank is probably one of the best ways. GMOs, so genetic modification, may also be one of the answers to that. Uh, but again, it's not included. And, and so your decision, if, if you find that that's a crucial point to this, is actually then to say, then I think this is less good because I don't actually believe that this is going to have as many benefits. The benefits are overestimated because it has not taken into account that there's a potential huge crash, crash waiting around the corner in 20 years. Uh, and you know, it's again one of those questions that you know, I'm, I'm just a poor representative of the guys who've actually done the studies. You should ask one of them, and then they may have a better answer. But I don't know the answer to that. Again, the, the, one, of the, one of the points we have to remember is we're sort of pushing uh, all of the academics in pretty much all of their areas here. Uh, and, and this is the best knowledge, I would argue, that we have. But it doesn't mean by any means this is perfect. Uh, you know, I would love everybody to have good models of everything, and we don't. Uh, climate change is actually, curiously enough, one of the places where we have the best models, because we've also spent a lot of money, and they've, you know, they've kind of known that they had to build models for a lot of different things. Uh, but most of these, for instance, agricultural models have very, very few variables in them. Uh, and so we push them to do more, but we haven't put in everything. So it also helps tackling global warming. If you, uh, uh, if you don't cut down forests, you don't uh, uh, release the CO2 into the atmosphere, and they actually estimate that keeping those trees has another uh, uh, billion, sorry, another trillion in value uh, in, uh, or, or thereabouts. So the total benefit cost ratio is estimated to be around 30 to 40 dollars. So for every dollar spent, you do 30 to 40 dollars worth of good. That's a phenomenal impact. But that's just one of the proposals. Let me just show you the other one. That's a much more straightforward. Because remember, this is basically a promise in future. The other one is a very, very simple one. It's basically just get more food to kids now. There's about 180 million kids that are undernourished, uh, uh, preschoolers that are undernourished. Let's try and help them. Uh, this is a list of all the things that we can give them and the price tags for each kid. So all in all, that adds up to about $96 to, uh, to, uh, uh, to basically make sure that they don't get malnourished in the first two uh, life years, so up till they're two years old. Very, very simple. We know how to do this. This is also including the distribution costs. Uh, so it's a very simple thing. We've tried it a lot. We know this works. Uh, the question is not really how much it costs, because we know that if we try to save about 31 million kids uh, each year in a cohort, uh, it'll cost us about uh, $3 billion a year. Um, and the benefits are going to be significant. Uh, we've ar actually argued this for quite a while, but we got good data uh, about a year and a half ago that I just briefly want to tell you about uh, from Guatemala. Uh, we've had good sort of theoretical arguments for a very long time. But uh, it actually, uh, there was a study done that started in the late 60s in Guatemala where American researchers went down, found two small villages in Guatemala, and, uh, uh, and, and gave the kids in those villages who were pretty malnourished, gave them good food. Then they found two other villages close by that were identical in all parameters and didn't give them good food. They essentially gave them you know, sugar or water instead. Uh, it was the 60s, you could get away with that, right? But, 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 the, but the fundamental point, of course, is this is a phenomenal study. They've now gone back and refound almost all of them. They found about 79% of them. So 3,500 kids that were both in the uh, control group and the actual study group. And the impact was phenomenal. 
they had better marriages, they had better jobs, they'd stayed longer in school, they'd learned more, you know, basically their brains and their muscles had developed, uh, they had better jobs, uh, they had fewer kids, if they're women, they had fewer uh, miscarriages, but crucially, if they avoided being stunted, they had three times the pay. So they were phenomenally more productive because they learned more in school, they were more valuable, they, they started this virtuous circle of actually helping their kids and becoming more productive. Now, we also have studies from about seven, uh, uh, four other countries with big studies, but not quite as long, uh, so, uh, so two in Africa and Bangladesh, and the net impact of this is estimated that if you can avoid uh, stunting, which is a good indicator of malnutrition, uh, you will get about three times the pay. Uh, we can avoid about a third of all stunting in these 31 million kids uh, per year. And so we actually estimate that for every dollar spent, on average, we're not going to help all of these kids, but on average, we're going to do $59 worth of good, which is a phenomenal impact. So again, the idea here is simply to say, and this is, again, remember, this only mentions or uh, investigate what's the benefit from schooling in the sense that you have a higher income. That's a very, very one-dimensional economic uh, input. And one of the things you could certainly say is there's also some intrinsic benefit in, in not you know, starving. Uh, so there's a lot of different other things you could pile into this, but one of the problems we have with economists is that once they have a big number, they feel like we don't really need to make it even bigger by putting in other stuff. But of course, if you're actually going to compare it to all the other stuff, what you actually do need to start thinking about all this. So basically what I'd like you to do now is to say you have these first two possibilities. If you were going to spend your money, how would you prioritize it? Can I ask you to talk to the person next to you and basically try to convince him or her why he or she is wrong and why they should prioritize it the other way around? Again, one, one of the things I'd, I, I hope becomes kind of obvious is that this suddenly starts a conversation where you can have a lot more discussions about, well, I actually think you could get more input. I think you could have less input on this, on this sort of thing. Had, if we had more time, you know, our Nobels and, and the about 100 experts spent about two years doing this. So in some sense, it's ridiculous that we're just doing a, a, an hour. So you know, please don't take this as sort of the full process, but it's a, a, it should be a, sort of a, a, an input. So hopefully, you now have something where you feel you know, somewhat confident that one of your proposals is better than the other. So let's move on and say, well, there are other problems in the world. So if you could take the next three issues, that, which are global warming, and I'm actually going to leave out the geoengineering, simply because it just takes too much time and we're, we have a short, short amount of time. So uh, I'd love to talk if, if somebody wants to talk about it afterwards. So we're just going to look at the, uh, the, the first two of these strips uh, and basically talk about well, how do we then prioritize this? Because that's obviously also a problem. And let's talk about what are the solutions here and how can we deal with it? Yes, CO2 heats up the planet. It's a significant temperature increase. It risks millions of people going hungry, billions with water stress, uh, uh, millions with coastal flooding, uh, uh, more malaria. There's lots of these risks. Uh, there's two points that we need to remember if we look at it from an economic angle. Uh, global warming will probably be beneficial for high latitude countries, which are typically uh, rich countries, because a little, you know, I come from Denmark, a little warming there might not be all that bad. Uh, but if you live in low latitude countries, which are typically poor countries, global warming is already bad and will only get worse. So actually, the net impact is probably going to be, in economic terms, first around the second half of the century, it's going to turn into a problem. So we're talking about a long term problem, not a short term problem. The second part is, no matter what you do with global warming, it's only going to impact in the second half of the century. So even if we cut dramatically now, because of the lag in the system, it's really only going to happen in the second half of, of this century. So this is not obviously technically true, but it'll have very little impact before uh, uh, the middle of the century. So we're talking about impacts now, sorry, uh, changes now that will have long-term impacts on the negative outcomes towards the end of the century. So again, we had lots of different people looking at this. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's actually six papers looking at adaptation, a lot of other things. I'm not going to talk about these. I'm just going to talk about two things. The carbon tax will reach the two-degree limit, which is 
presumably what all political leaders have signed up to. We are obviously not anywhere near to actually doing that uh, in, in real policies, but we look at what would that take. And then also uh, the other solution, make green energy cheaper through innovation. Uh, but as you can see, there's lots and lots of other opportunities, geoengineering, adaptation, carbon taxes, lots of other uh, things, you know, deal with methane, black soot, technology transfer, forests, so on and so forth. So again, I'm just going to look at two of these solutions and get a sense of what could we do. If we did want to get a two degree limit, uh, the researchers ran this on all the major macroeconomic uh, uh, climate energy models. They're all collated under the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum, which is considered to be the gold standard of, of energy modeling uh, in the world. There are 11 models there. Uh, actually, six of the models say we can't do the two degree limit. We're just simply too far ahead. There's no way you can plausibly do this with, within the, the models. Uh, so the researchers just looked at the five models and say it can be done. So in, in some sense, we're already looking at the optimistic uh, models. Uh, remember Obama, Merkel, uh, uh, pretty much uh, Cameron, pretty much any leader in the world have at least in principle signed up to these targets, but we're not doing anything close to doing that. If we were to do it, and if we we're going to do it in the most effective way, we'd have to raise carbon taxes you know, significantly now, dramatically towards the end of the century, essentially outlawing uh, fossil fuels, or at least the emissions of CO2 from fossil fuels. Um, that is equivalent, just you know, to get a sense of, of, of proportion, uh, to, to have a 60 uh, cent per gallon of, 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 of gasoline carbon tax now and have about $25 per gallon of gasoline uh, by the end of the century. Uh, I think you sort of can see that that might be a, a hard political task to do in, in the US. Um, it's also perhaps important to recognize that a lot of countries could actually not afford to do this. There'd just not be, you know, if you wanted to, we're, we're, ass, we're assuming that you'd switch taxation towards uh, carbon fuels and away from other places so you'd still have the same taxation. But actually there are many countries that don't have enough taxation to actually achieve that. Uh, so you'd have a net tax increase in these countries, which would probably also be uh, problematic. But even if you could actually do it, and again, remember this is the economically most efficient way to do it, this would reduce temperature increases significantly from 3.5 to 2 degrees by design. Uh, and it would have a very significant cost. This is also what the UN came out and said uh, about a, a month and a half ago. Uh, the cost is in the order of 13% of GDP by the end of the century, so about $40,000 billion per year, mostly in lost GDP growth. So that's a significant cost. Uh, the, there would also be significant benefits, but obviously in a much lower scale. Uh, we estimate the benefits would be in the order of $2 trillion per year, so $2,000 billion per year. Uh, also, the benefits come much later than the cost. The cost will occur immediately and ramp up, whereas the benefits will come much later and also ramp up. So if you do the cost, and this is actually done out for 300 years, but you know, it gives pretty much the same, uh, the same outcome, the benefit cost ratio is about 0.02. So for every dollar spent, you avoid about two cents of climate dam damage or you do two cents worth of good. That's one of the reasons why I've been ar arguing that, that you know, dealing with climate change in this way is actually not a very smart way. Of course, this upsets some people, uh, but I think you know, at least there's, there's quite a bit of market margin to, to, uh, to be wrong and still you know, sort of get the sign uh, right that this is probably not a beneficial way to tackle global warming. There is an other way, and that's the fundamental way of looking at making green energy cheaper. If we could make green energy much cheaper through innovation, so basically get breakthrough technologies, we could potentially, for much less money, get much more reduction in CO2. Essentially, of course, if we could get green energy to be so cheap that it was cheaper than fossil fuels, everyone would switch and we'd be done talking about this. People would just simply switch and we'd, you know, uh, we wouldn't be needing to talk about global warming anymore. Um, so this would ta tackle global warming in the long run, but obviously not in the short run. Uh, the argument here is to say that we should probably get up on the order of magnitude of $100 billion per year, which is obviously much more than what we're talking about here, but they believe that this is scalable certainly in the, in the short and medium term, so we could decide to spend a significant portion of our $75 billion on this, and we'd probably get about the same benefit cost ratio. And so because we have estimates from a lot of other investment in research and development, we're talking about new technology, so obviously we don't know what is going to come out of it. 
but the estimate is that this would give a benefit cost ratio of about 11. So because we would be spending money now to making sure that we had better technologies to reduce CO2 more in the future, we would actually see less global warming in the long run because people would switch more. Remember, this is totally a future dependent argument. You know, it may not happen, but there's a good chance that it would happen. And essentially, if you spend it, for instance, on a thousand different technologies, you don't need all thousand to come through. You basically just need one of them to come through. And because research is so much cheaper than actual production, you can afford to spend it on, say, a thousand different technologies. And again, we just need one of them to come out. Uh, uh, to actually become cheaper, and that's the one that'll solve it. Just to give you one s example of this, uh, the US fracking, uh, which obviously is not a green solution in the sense that it has solved global warming, uh, but, but fracking has made gas much cheaper in the US, uh, so the US has uh, historically, totally unprecedentedly, sh shifted from uh, producing electricity with coal to producing electricity with gas. You've switched about seven percentage points. That has cost you to cut carbon emissions so much that you've, we estimate it's about 300 megatons per year uh, in total. Obviously, there's also been an economic uh, recession, and you've also had more wind. But if you take that out, uh, it's probably about 300 megatons. If you look at what the total reduction from all solar and wind in the world, that's estimated to be about 275 megatons. So sort of inadvertently, the US has actually reduced more CO2 emissions through fracking than all of the world's wind and solar. And of course, you make money off of, of, of cutting uh, CO2 with uh, fracking, basically because you save about $100 billion per year uh, from fracking, whereas uh, solar panels probably cost the world, the uh, International Energy Agency estimated it's about $60 billion in, in, in subsidies per year. So the simple point is that only happened because the DOE uh, and others uh, you know, subsidized the innovation of fracking in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when nobody could make money off of it. And of course, that point was not to be green. It was not at all. And it's not either a green solution in the long run, but it could be a bridge solution in the sense that it brings us to lower carbon emissions. And then eventually, of course, we need to move to other technologies that will actually totally reduce uh, carbon emissions. You know, remember, fossil fuels are incredibly good for really, really many. You know, we, we tend to think of it as, as, as really evil. But imagine your world without energy. That's a terrible world. Uh, I, I, uh, Matt Ridley has a, has a fun sort of story about why is it fun to be Louis XIV, or why was it fun to be Louis XIV? He had 60 people just prepare dinner for him every night. You know, he had you know, literally thousands of, of servants uh, helping him. That's really, really cool if you're Louis XIV, but not very cool if you're one of the thousand people. Right? It's a very unsustainable solution. Most, of, most people can't be the king, and a lot of people end up being servants. But what essentially fossil fuels, or the availability of cheap energy is, uh, has allowed us, is that we all have lots and lots of servants. You know, remember uh, 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 Labor God, uh, another American economist, you know, said uh, the washing machine in 1900 was essentially the American housewife. Uh, but you know, now she doesn't do that anymore because we actually have a washing machine. You have a vacuum uh, and you have lots of other technologies. So if you look at it energy-wise, uh, uh, the average European have about 150 manpower 24-7 at our disposal through our energy usage. So we have 150 servants. The US has about 300, uh, and India has about 15. So it's a solution to the, the very basic problem that you have lots of opportunity to do stuff that you couldn't otherwise do. And that people are willing to spend a lot of money on. So you really have to ramp up the carbon uh, tax very, very high if you want people to essentially shut it off. Now, of course, a low carbon tax will shut up a, a little bit. You'll sort of cut at the margin. But you won't do very much of it because you actually really like your fossil fuel. And so you have to ramp it up really high. Yeah, I'm just curious why you didn't start high. Oh, oh what, OK. Yes, all right, sorry. Sorry, why, why do we need to ramp it up? Well, fundamentally, because every economist would say you want to give people time to not, uh, you know, if, if you had a really, really high carbon tax right now, it would actually only help a little bit more because you'd cut like 20, 20 more years. But it would have huge costs because you've just built this power plant, and now you have to shut it down uh, instead of letting it run for 20 years, and then when it's old, shutting it down. So it's essentially an, an efficiency argument uh, that anything you do, you want to ramp it in so you also get the innovation opportunity and you get the replacement opportunity in there. So if I could ask you, 
how would you prioritize these four interventions and saying you, know, you can only spend a limited amount of money. Do they go in between the, the, the solutions you have already? Do they go up on top, down the bottom? So if you could just spend uh, you know, 30 seconds talking to the person next to you, again, on how you're going to rank these four opportunities. Because you can't spend your money on all of it, so where would you spend your money first? I'm sorry for rushing you along, but let me just take the last bit and talk about one more issue, namely education. So these are the last two strips. So basically, I just want you to tear up uh, those two again and see where do they fit into the grand scheme of things. Where would you spend your money uh, if you only had $75 billion and, and wanted to do the most good? So if you look at education, you know, the fundamental good news about education is we got most kids into school. In 1960, 41% of all kids were not in school. And today, it's only about 10% that are not in school. And these are almost all in failed states. So fundamentally, we've gotten most kids into school. The problem is, of course, that most of these schools suck. Uh, and, and for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but, you know, a lot of this is incentive structure. Uh, the problem really is. Uh, improving quality, and that's also the conversation in the U.S. It's actually the conversation everywhere. Uh, I don't know if you know the PISA studies from OECD, uh, where they, you know basically see which countries are best. You know, Shanghai always come out on top, but that's because they self-select these schools, so they're probably not really representative. It, 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 it surprisingly typically turns out that Finland is the best schooling country in the world, and you know we have some ideas, but it's it's also a little hard to understand exactly why is that. Uh, and so the problem is we really don't know how to deal with quality. We don't know how to make quality better. One of the obvious ways would be to say, well, let's pay teacher, you know, let's keep good teachers and fire bad teachers. It turns out that that's actually both very, very hard to do, as you've discovered in the US, uh, but also that it's very hard to show uh, there's, there's typically very little difference on an objective scale between good and bad teachers. One way you could do that, of course, was to say, well, we're going to pay you according to your test results. But we've tried that. And the typical outcome is that then the teachers teach to the test, or even worse, they cheat on the test. Uh, so, so it turns out to be really, really hard to do. Um, so there's one good solution. That's actually the best solution that we have is nutrition. That was one we looked at before. Surprisingly, nutrition doesn't do anything about schooling quality, but essentially because it improves your brain and your brain development, you learn more even if you're in a sucky school. So in some sense, yes, it's not an ideal solution, but it's a pretty good solution. It's a great way to get more out of even bad schools. Uh, but I'm going to uh, show you two. So nutrition is actually what most uh, education economists come out and say is probably the best investment in education because we know it works. And it's sort of a, a way around not trying to deal with schools. But there are two other ways. Uh, one is conditional cash transfers. That's the first uh, solution that you have. This is essentially paying parents to send their kids to school. Uh, it's something we know works. It's been very, very well studied, mostly in, uh, uh, in Latin America. Uh, but even uh, Bloomberg tried it out in New York. It didn't work all out all that well. But you know, fundamentally, it works. You know, it's a very simple thing. Uh, uh, we also know it, it increases uh, attendance significantly, but not you know dramatically by any by any means. A large part of the benefit is actually that it improves health. Because if you pay especially to poor parents, uh, especially if you pay to women, uh, so the mothers in, in the family, they'll spend part of that money on the kid's health. Now, that's not really schooling, but it's still good. Uh, so it'll actually end up overall being a good thing. Uh, the total benefit cost ratio is 5.2. So yeah, it's a nice thing, but it's not a phenomenal outcome, mostly because this is still just on quantity. Right? We're not actually dealing with the basic problem of improving quality, we're just simply improving quantity. We're getting more kids into uh, schools that pretty much are still bad. And it's also the reason why it's, it's not a better benefit cost ratio is because we have to pay all parents. Most of parents would still have sent their kids to school even if we hadn't paid them. So we're basically paying everyone to get a little increase in attendance. And yes, then we get the better health outcomes. Actually, about three of the five comes from health. So this is mostly actually a transfer of money to poor uh, families, which is still good, but it's not 
got all that much to do with education. But one of the things that it really shows is we don't know very well what works in education, which of course is one of the reasons why the West is also having this huge discussion. You have a discussion about how we're going to make our schools better. We have it in Denmark. We have it in most OECD countries. We don't quite know how to do this. So again, mostly quantity, not quality. The second solution is what I think is a phenomenally interesting one, but it'll have another issue that I think is rampant in many of these conversations. We don't know enough about the solution right now. Uh, so this is more sort of a, a gambling solution for you. It's essentially the idea of an information campaign. Most kids that live in rural areas have no idea what's the value of education because the only educated person they see is the teacher in this, uh, uh, in this village, and he or she is typically not very well paid. Uh, so the information campaign is essentially telling rural kids how much more are you going to make if you get to the urban area, which you probably will, when you grow up, if you have a high school education compared to if you don't have a high school education. We're not telling many you know, false information. We're really just telling them what is the average payoff in your country if you go to the city and if you have an, a rural, if you have a high school outcome versus if you don't. So you teach both the kids and their parents about the payoffs. You show them the statistics, basically show them you're probably going to make two or three times as much pay if you have your high school uh, education. It's very cheap, obviously, uh, information campaigns are very, very cheap, although this is more than just a pamphlet. It's actually several times in, uh, during the year going out and explaining it to the parents, explaining it to the kids, getting them to understand and sort of saying, yes, I really want to uh, stay in school and learn more. But it actually really works. It get kids to stay in school uh, and learn more and actually graduate at much higher levels. The problem is we don't have a lot of studies. We actually only have two studies, and they give very, very different results. And that's why I'm showing you this is, this is one of the problems that we typically have. We have a great idea, but we just don't have enough data. So in some sense, this will come down to also what's your gut instinct on this. From Madagascar, these are both period published studies. From Madagascar, we had a benefit cost ratio of about 1,000. Uh, you know, the, the Nobel said we don't believe this, but you know, I think that's really honestly more sort of on a gut level. Uh, clearly, they left out some of the, uh, the significant costs, but they have been peer reviewed. The other one is uh, the Dominican Republic, which had a much more sort of sensible uh, benefit cost ratio of about 13, so in, in between 8 and 19. So the real issue here is to say we don't know why these uh, are so different. You'd obviously have to do a lot more of these tests. We will do that. We will know in, in five or 10 years much better whether this is a good idea. But if you had to spend money next year, in some sense, you'd just have to live with the fact that we only have two studies. And you have to decide, do I want to sort of gamble some of my money on this, or do I just play it safe and say it's probably just 13? Uh, so at the end of the day, these are not great outcomes. One, one of the things I also wanted to show with using education is essentially that some solutions are really, really good and very obvious, and you probably haven't heard about them. Other areas like education we talk a lot about, but unfortunately we don't have very many good solutions. And our approach to the Copenhagen consensus is to say, let's not try and solve stuff we don't know how to solve when there's so many things we do know how to solve that could do so much more good. So in a sense, this is really just showing you the dilemma that we constantly uh, end up in. So if I could ask you, and I know that you have to leave in just a second, if I could ask you then to prioritize all of these six, and then I'm, we're just going to make a very quick vote on who's going to uh, think that these are, these are great. So just talk to the person next to you for 30 seconds and agree on how you're going to prioritize all of these six. When, when we do this with Nobels, apart from having lots more time, we also take all of their rankings and take the median of this ranking. So essentially, if you were this group, you'd have to not just pull up your thing you want high up. That's not going to actually work, because you need to pull the median of the room. So you'd have to come up with good arguments why your preferred solution is really much better and get at least half the room to move in that direction. Uh, we don't have that time, so I'm simply just going to do a very, very quick thing. Uh, you know, if I could ask you to vote for your top two solutions, and then I'm basically just going to, you know, we're not going to count votes in here because we're, we're not, we don't have 75 billion anyway. All right, do we? No. <laughs> no, no, so, so let's just get a sense of, of what the room thinks. But if I could just ask you, who would vote? So just vote for your two top uh, priorities. Who would vote for R&D to increase yield enhancements? 
All right, pretty good outcome, uh, uh, reduced uh, chronic undernutrition in preschoolers. That's pretty much everyone. A high global carbon tax. One, very, very proud. Uh, uh, increased green R&D. All right, uh, conditional cash transfers to schooling and information campaign on schooling. All right, so it, it, it seems very, very unofficial uh, counting uh, the chronic undernutrition and uh, uh, green energy R&D were the two main uh, outcomes. And, and again, the, my, my point here is not so much to say, you know, this is not, you know, we're not talking about exactly how we're going to spend 75 billion because we want to go much more into detail in the conversation about how all these models generate and how do we trust them. But the point is to say that this is a phenomenal way to get a lot of people from very, very different angles to talk in the same language of cost effectiveness. Uh, I've done this with uh, young political uh, uh, leaders from, uh, in many different countries, uh, from, from the extreme left to the extreme right. And the fun thing is to say, you know, they think they're going to disagree a lot. But suddenly, when you get down to it, you know, most people really want to do good. And then you want to start finding out what really works. And of course, there'll still be differences. But a lot of it disappears when you start talking about what's actually cost effective. And so one of my hopes is that talking more about rationality and efficiency helps us get past some of these sort of ideological hang-ups that we have where we believe, no, no, I strongly believe this, or I strongly support that solution, but rather that we start talking about, no, no, if we, did, if we spent the money over here, we'd do more good. And that is a phenomenal argument. And that's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the UN. Uh, I just want to briefly tell you about this with just half a minute. Uh, the UN is actually doing the next set of uh, sort of goals for the next 15 years. Uh, and, and this may actually end up directing about $700 billion to development aid. Uh, and, and right now, there's about 140 goals on the table. Of course, if you have 140 you know, priorities, you don't really have any. Uh, and so everybody knows that you need to cut these down, but it's very, very hard. And we're actually trying to take this sort of pr uh, methodology to basically say, where do you get a lot of bang for your goals, and where do you get little bang for your, for your goals? Again, you know, there's going to be lots of other ideological and political con controversies, and people are going to have different views simply because they come from different places in the planet. You know, if you don't have any malaria, you don't think malaria is probably all that much important uh, compared to if you have lots of malaria in your home country, and on and on. But if we can get that conversation in there, even if we can only do a little good, imagine if we could sw switch out one bad goal for one good goal. Given that we're leveraging about $700 billion, that could be a lot of billions of dollars we could end up doing good. So the reality here is really just, and I hope that's what I can leave you with, is this sort of process, if we, if we use this both in the global issues but also in our everyday life, ask constantly, what's the bang for the buck? Where do we get the most good? We'll hopefully end up doing more good. And that, I think, would be something that is worth applauding both from the left and the right uh, of, of, of the political spectrum and something that we could all get together on, on doing. So thank you very much for playing along. It was great talking to you guys. <laughs> <laughs>